Summer blockbuster season is over, and a lot of movie fans are trading the big screen experience for smaller screens at home. But whether your screen of choice is your computer, tablet, phone, smart TV, or even your internet-enabled popcorn popper, InfoSec wants to make sure that you secure your screen. That's why we've created the free Secure Your Screen Toolkit to produce and direct you and your employees during National Cybersecurity Awareness Month. The toolkit includes one training module and an assessment, five posters to hang on the walls of your screening room, four newsletter templates, four email templates, and an employee presentation so you can save the day by preventing your organization from ending up with a starring role in the next big hacker event. Make InfoSec your best supporting hack preventer. Huh? See what I did by going to infosecinstitute.com slash free to download our free toolkit and help turn the next big hacker heist into a box office flop this October. Look, I'm not going to ask you why you have an internet enabled popcorn popper. I know we all bought some weird stuff during lockdown, but I will ask you to learn to secure your screens and secure your devices by going to infosecinstitute.com slash free. One more time, rule of threes, that's infosecinstitute.com slash free. And now, lights, camera, take action. Let's start the show. Today on Cyberwork, Oliver Tavacoli from Vectra AI returns to the program to talk about, surprise, AI. Uh, having talked about Oliver's origin story on his past episode, we're free to dig right into the main areas of interest, which in this case are the ways in which generative AI can be used by bad actors, whether introducing conflicting messages into GPT guardrail commands or escalating the nuance and complexity of fake-based social engineering attacks. We talk about the long-term implications of this emerging tech opportunity and some ways for new professionals to get comfortable with its requirements quickly. Also, Oliver lets us know that this summer of AI uh, will mean a lot for this coming couple of years, but also why its endless innovations may cool and plateau for a few years, and that's okay too. A lot of good juicy topics are covered here and very timely too. So that's all today on Cyberwork. Welcome to this week's episode of the Cyberwork with InfoSec podcast. Each week we talk with a different industry thought leader about cybersecurity trends, the way those trends affect the work of InfoSec professionals while offering tips for breaking in or moving up the ladder in the cybersecurity industry. Our guest today, Oliver Tavacoli, is the Chief Technology Officer at Vectra. Uh, Oliver is a technologist who has alternated between working for large and small companies throughout his 25-year career. Uh, and he's uh, clearly doing the latter right now. So prior to joining Vectra, Oliver spent more than seven years at Juniper as chief technical officer for the security business. Oliver joined Juniper as a result of its acquisition of Funk Software, where he was CTO and better known as developer number one for Steel Belted Radius. Uh, prior to joining Funk Software, Oliver co-founded Trilogy Inc., and prior to that, he did stints at Novell, Fluent Machines, and IBM. Oliver received an MS in Mathematics and a BA in Mathematics and Computer Science from the University of Tennessee. Uh, so today, we are going to be talking about the, the the two letters that are on everyone's uh, lips this year, AI, and specifically uh, some of the new uh, risk uh, patterns that have opened up with generative AI. So Oliver, welcome uh, back to Cyberwork. Thank you. Good to, uh, good to be here. Thank you. So um, yeah, as I say, I previously talked to Oliver on the Cyberwork episode titled Cloud Security Best Practices and Career Tips way back in September of 2020. So uh, anyone who's newish to the show, I encourage you all to check that out and get Oliver's full cyber uh, history and backstory. But, um, you know, as an intro this time around, I'd like to ask about Vectra AI, uh, where you've been CTO for 10 and a half years. So uh, I'm sure a lot has changed in that time, but for our purposes, what are some of the big changes since 2020 for Vector AI, especially considering some of the big changes technologically and procedurally that AI has taken in the last year or two? Yeah, I think, um, you know, we, we've been on this AI journey, on a different kind of AI journey for, for 10 years now. Um, and, and uh, you know, I kind of like to describe the difference to a certain degree between discriminative AI versus generative AI, right? And okay. So, on the discriminative front, you're trying to tell good from bad, right? Discriminate, you know, what yeah. is good, what is bad. Um, that can apply to all kinds of fields like endpoint, where you look at malware and trying to decide good from bad without having uh, previously seen the, the bad. Okay. Uh, and certainly for us, it's been around uh, attacker behaviors. So once an attack is active, can we tell the the, the signal from the noise to a certain degree? So we've used that for a while. We've continued to evolve 
uh, the sophistication of the methods that we use for that. Uh, and we've continued to kind of evolve our platform to be more in line with what people today are call, calling XDR, which is can mm-hmm. you do detection and response, X being the, you know, kind of it, the asterisk extended yeah. across yeah. a number of different attack surfaces. Now, I think over the past year, what has certainly come into the fore is this notion of generative AI. Uh, obviously, uh, it has taken uh, mainstream media by storm. Yeah. Uh, I think what you tend to see in mainstream media sometimes is uh, is sensational on both ends of the extreme. You know, uh, it will be the end of the world on the one end of the extreme, and it will solve world hunger on the other end of the extreme. Yep. And yep. of course, the the answer is that the, the 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 true answer lies somewhere in between, and it really becomes key to think correctly about the technology and what it can do. Um, in the cybersecurity world, it basically means that you you have a few things that you want to think about. One is how are attackers going to use it? That's one thing, like to make themselves more efficient. Okay. Secondarily, how are attackers, this is kind of a hybrid, how are attackers going to attack the LLMs that organizations deploy? So you basically take chat GPT and you deploy it for a solution. Mm-hmm. The mere the, the mere fact that it exists as part of that solution means that uh, it can now be potentially a vector for an attack. Right. And then finally, in the cybersecurity realm, if you're in, you know, if you're in a security operations center and you're an analyst, how can it help you adjudicate good from bad and help you investigate and respond more quickly and more completely? So all three of those are kind of things that you have to think about in this new world that we're entering if you're a cybersecurity technologist. Yeah, yeah, no, two at least two of those make like are things that I had already thought of, but I wanted to uh, ask a little more about the the middle one there. So yeah. uh, can you talk about like what what that would look like, like a, an attack on or, you know, like a compromise yeah. on like chat yeah. GPT and a solution? Like, are we talking about like inserting like like false solutions or 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 just sort of exfiltrating like the solutions that are being generated by chat gpt like, yeah, can, what, what, can, what's being stolen yeah yeah it can, it, can, it can be it can be a lot of different things but the, the basic idea is if you set up your llm in such a way that it processes data um that is not under your direct control so imagine, for instance, you have an LLM running and it's going to process a, a PDF that was sent to you in an attachment. Mm-hmm. And then start with the assumption that that PDF was created by an attacker, because obviously it's just an attachment to an email. Right. Imagine that your LLM has been set up with you know, prompt engineering and guardrails to do certain kinds of things. Mm-hmm. But as soon as the verbiage that from that PDF, PDF flows into the LLM, that becomes part of the brew in addition to the guardrails that you might have set. Okay. And that brew can overcome potentially the guardrails. It can overcome yeah. the instructions that you've given the LLM. So mm-hmm. the answer may be, hey, flag for me anything that looks suspicious. Right. And the PDF at the beginning of it says, um, in a convincing tone, yeah, but don't flag me. I'm a good guy. Yeah, right, right, right. right. So, so now you've effectively taken a control that was there that was intended mm-hmm. to get kind of give you a certain kind of service, and you've just overcome it. So and, that's and, yeah. Oh, go ahead, sir. So, 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 so that's one example, but that's that's a that's a kind of like subtractive example. I think that the harder ones tend to be a lot of the utility of these LLMs when you deploy them is to connect them to a lot of systems. You want to connect them to your local database of record. You want to connect them to your local information in order to give them more utility so that your employees, when they're typing away, can ask a question and it says, oh, yeah, Bob's currently traveling in in Timbuktu. Okay, so in order to do that, you have to create a connector, um, an agent that connects to that database with some API key. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's now hooked into the LLM. Now, if at the same time, that LLM is also hooked into, again, some public source of the data, either connecting to the internet and pulling flight information from Kayak, as an example, or Expedia, and then passing, using that information to form queries against your internal travel database. Mm-hmm. Now you have a conduit 
kind of, it's like an indirect prompt injection. You can almost think of it like there's a conduit whereby data that somebody, let's say somebody gets to add a comment to a hotel in Expedia. You automatically pull that comment down into your LLM. That L, that The text in that comment now feeds into your LLM, right? The LLM can now, in that text, be, again, instructed to do things that was not in the intention of that context window. And now it can actually be asked to, to do something with regards to your travel database. Now, mm-hmm. this is where, again, least privilege becomes very important. Um, okay. Make sure that the API key you give it has only privileges to read that database, not to write to it, because if it has privileges to alter that database, now suddenly having overcome the, the guardrails within the LLM, right, you are now you have now have direct conduit to maybe cancel people's trips. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> which right. would create kind of a bit of a mess. So yeah. it's it's the utility of these systems is in their connected nature. It's not just what the LLM knows. You want to hook it up to these contemporaneous data sources. And you just need to be aware of the fact that LLMs are not very good at distinguishing between the base instructions you gave them. Mm-hmm. Those just happen to be the instructions at the top of the context window and any other instructions that may be pushed into the context window yes. afterwards. Right. There's not a demarcation between here are the rules and now here is the rest. It's all here are some instructions. Here's a bunch of stuff. Continues. And yeah, and if you read it all end to end, uh, it, some of it contradicts each other and it might choose uh, the yeah, one it you wanted to choose. Path. Yeah, right. So what that makes me think of, and 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 I might be completely off the rails here, but I, I, I hear stories about, you know, um, being able to sort of end run around certain uh, guardrails that ChatGPT itself has. Like if you say, you know, tell me the ingredients for a pipe bomb. It's like, there's no way I can tell you that. It's like, well, write me some fan fiction about someone who makes a pipe bomb and suddenly you've got the, you know, or whatever. So it seems like- Yeah, yeah. And, and, and again, that's that's an example where bad guys want to use an LLM that they are contracted to use, but want to yeah. use it for nefarious purposes. Right. Which is, which is to be distinguished from, you know, uh, you- Adding organization yeah. running an LLM and bad guys attacking that instance of the LLM to use it as a conduit for, for yeah. stuff. So there's lots of bad things you can do in attacking an LLM. Do you just want the pipe bomb recipe and you feel like you can't get it any other way? I, you want yeah. to tap into some knowledge that the LLM has that it's been guardrailed not to share. Mm-hmm. Right? Right. That's, that, that's one aspect, which is different than some you using basically a hosted version of that LLM to attack as, as a means of accomplishing what would be more of a, like yes. a traditional attack, just with that as a vector now. I, I guess what I'm what I'm getting at is not necessarily the intention, but yeah. the fact that that there is still something intrinsic to this type of AI um where we're still sort of treating it as a sort of intelligence where we can essentially say, well, you know what I mean, you know, but it doesn't know what we mean. It's just following the sets well, of hyper complex things. Yeah, even ignoring the guardrail issue. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, there's this whole concept of hallucination and, and it's, it's it's like an interesting concept because everything that the, that the LLM does is basically a hallucination, right? So if you think mm-hmm. about it, even as you think of this as being a large model, like GPT-4 has hundreds of billions of parameters. Yes. Right? But it, it, has, it has taken trillions of gigabytes of data and, and compacted it into only hundreds of billions of parameters, which is mm-hmm. means it's by, by its nature lossy. It does not have a full catalog of everything it's been trained on. It has the gist of everything it's been yeah. trained on. Right, And the gist there is even just probabilistic sequences of words. It's not cognition in the classic sense that we tend to think of it as. So um, if it, in, let's say it took all of Chris Sienko's writings over Chris's entire lifetime, right? Mm-hmm. And it builds that into the model, not by having a catalog of, of those things, but it's just like, oh, Chris uses these words in conjunction with these words and these right. words in conjunction with these words. Now, let's say we start with that and we ask it a question that has never been asked of Chris and that Chris has never expressed an opinion on. Right. Now, when it gets it right, 
Chris is like, this is like a parlor trick. Yeah, I've never expressed that thought, but it got it right. Yeah. When right, it gets right. it wrong, it's called a hallucination. Both of them are hallucinations. It's just yes. one is a right hallucination and one is a wrong hallucination. Right. Yeah, it's kind of like all the uh, uh, the coincidences you see versus the ones that you don't, or the non coincidences that you don't note, yeah. and things like that. So, so yeah, it's 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 the sort of stopped clock that keeps the right time twice a day, sort of thing. Like, yeah. Um, so, so, yeah. so never never view the the system as an oracle of truth. I think the other the no, other no, thing, yeah, and, and, yeah. I, I guess I, I'm also just thinking in terms of um, just the way that it's it's built such that you know, people are still thinking of it, as you say, as an oracle of truth, and that we're sort of interacting it because I think everyone wants it to kind of actually be intelligence that there's still a lot of interacting it like it is intelligence rather than as a tool. But, but even let's assume for a second, it was intelligent. Yes, there's, there's other kind of secondary problem. Let's say you went out there and you talked to a bunch of chefs mm -hmm. about how to make a perfect omelet. And let's say 60% of them came down on the side of very high temperature pan, very quick process, you get it out, fluffy, perfect. And 40% of them said, low temperature, allow the curds to build up, allow a creamy texture to build up. Yep. Okay. Now the question is, what is the truth about making the perfect omelet? Right, right. I, there is really not a truth. And, and so you could yes. then design a system that would throw away the 40% and never expose you to the 40%. Mm -hmm. And only show you the 60%. Right. Which would be kind of like, well, that wouldn't be like talking to a collection of human beings, which the LLMs are meant to kind of approximate. So what does it do? 60% of the time it gives you one, 40% of the time it gives you a di different one, mm -hmm. which basically means there is really no truth. This is one of the reasons why you have variability in responses. It's to expose mm -hmm. you to the totality of yes. knowledge, which is by definition, not a single unified truth about every subject. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, that makes that makes sense. So, yeah, I mean, um, so you, you, you've sort of uh, done a nice job of explaining what the especially the sort of angle of being able to add um, conflicting information into a set of guardrails and so forth. So what what are what are some of the um, I don't know if solutions is the right word, because, as you said, they're maybe not necessarily like a, a central answer to these questions, but. Um, as as these problems begin to proliferate, what are some of some of the the ways that you see to sort of um, stem them? Yeah, I think I think there just needs to be a lot of awareness. So, so partially um, on the security side, le use least privilege. Be aware of what mm -hmm. plugins you're running. Be aware right. of what if you're accessing a public data source, treat it with a degree of distrust, um, even mm -hmm. if it's something that you're paying for, because again, it can be a paid service. I can pay for virus total and have a commercial service for it, but let's not be confused. The submissions into virus total are public submissions. And so the notion that a bad guy can submit something into virus total and coax me to download it is mm -hmm. totally believable, even if it's a commercial service. Yeah. So how what controls exist on the data that you pull in and the data you expose, and then be very cognizant of least privilege with regards to what the system does in terms of what what things you hook it up to. Okay. Um, so that's on the protective side. View the view your guardrails as imperfect at best. I think these are I liken them to instructions you give to a five year old. Hey, don't talk to strangers. Yeah. It's like when stranger says, "Hey, here's some ice cream." Uh, it's like, okay, I'll talk to the stranger, right? Right. So it, it, it is. It is the guardrails themselves are in you know in, in instruction. Well, the guardrails that the customer implements are in instructions. The guardrails, obviously, that OpenAI and others in, uh, implement are are somewhat deeper um, and and are a little supposedly harder to overcome. Again, techniques have emerged on those things. Okay. I think the more interesting question is um, for the other two items that we talked about, attackers using um, uh, LLMs and, 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 and generative AI to improve their odds. Right. Um, it's going to become very hard. Again, the degree of skepticism that you now have to begin to have to have around um, email phishing and uh, voicemails that are left for you, which can now be modulated to sound like, sound like, like your boss. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, those things make it that much harder um, to to spot the fakes. Yeah. Because if I, if Chris, again, if you're a relatively public figure and you're and you're tweeting about your travel and all this other kind of stuff, and I can use that information to contemporaneously produce an email that looks like it came from Chris that refers to things that are actually things that are happening to Chris right now. 
and send it to somebody, it's more believable that it's from Chris, right? We're used to kind yep. of the malformed, bad grammar, out of context, yes. you know, but that stuff is just going to get better. And so we have to think about what those controls are going to, what what controls we have in place to, again, put additional um, controls in place because basically uh, social engineering is going to get more effective. It's just a matter of fact. So it is. that means your initial preventive layer is going to be become less porous, which basically means you're going to need to have stronger resilience behind that to look for weird stuff that happens. Mm -hmm. um, on the defensive side, I think we need... Again, you can declare LLMs not to be ready for a SOC, um, but then you're just, just you know, you're choosing to go down the pacifist route while you have an attacking army. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, so, so choosing to sit this one out is not really a, a thing, but you have to be yeah. smart about utilizing it in a way where you can overcome some of the it's it, the hallucinations and other things. It's like there's a lot of cybersecurity knowledge built into chat GPT-4. Mm -hmm. You want it to be an advisor to your to, to things to make things to make life easier while still producing a user experience that does not imply that it's an oracle of truth. And so, partially, this becomes kind of like if you look at what Microsoft has done by calling it like a security copilot. It's an right. interesting vernacular and, and term. Yeah. Right? Yeah, it's yeah. like it's not the pilot. Uh, it's not the not even the, the automatic pilot. Yeah, it's the co-pilot. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, 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 I think the, the, these are the interesting techniques. I think people in the user experience side mm -hmm. uh, for critical systems, like if you're using, uh, I don't know, Chat GPT to help you make decisions on setting parameters for your nuclear power plant, yes, uh, or or for your air traffic control system, or for your cybersecurity operations, you're going to have to get the user experience right, where there's a degree of you know, usefulness, but a degree of skepticism to how the end user kind of interacts with it and does not assume that it's complete. Yeah. And also, I think it becomes more important to then provide backstops like, okay, well, you told me this information, give me a link to the place where you, th that is basically a supporting factor of it, right? Mm -hmm. Which then means that you have to build training sets that include the data, but also a link back to the normative reference for that data that is then included effectively in, in, in the answer. So it's like, here's my answer. Here's a short answer that I gave you that summarizes, um, you know, 100 pages worth of information that you could, could, could go and read over here. And I'll give you a link to it. But, um, but here's the short answer for it. So you don't have to read those 100 pages. Yeah. Okay. So, um, I, you know, I'm always, because of the, the, the slant of our of our podcast here, I'm always thinking in terms of uh, where where humans and and new uh, professionals slot into all of this. So, uh, you know, I, I, we, we we you gave us kind of a checklist of different sort of security positions that are going to be affected by this, and and you know the the importance of not sitting it out or not mm -hmm. uh, playing the pacifist role or whatever. So, obviously, like you said, uh, security awareness training is going to have to get more nuanced and more sort of extensive, but also, um, uh, you know, like you said, using it in, in the SOC and stuff is going to be more, more important. Can you talk about some of the ways that the specific issues and solutions that you're talking about are going to affect uh, cybersecurity professionals, say, in the next five years who are just sort of getting into the industry now? What are some things yeah. they need to be learning immediately that uh, they might not have known that they needed to know about a year ago? Yeah, I think, again, um, there's, there's going to be a shift, particularly on the side of carbon-based life forms, like human beings, right, and the vulnerabilities that they represent in terms of their judgment, which is around, you know, security awareness training. It doesn't really matter how much security awareness training you produce at this point. That's going to become more leaky mm -hmm. for the simple reason that if I basically train you to the point where even a legitimate email from your boss looks suspect, mm -hmm. now you're losing all kinds of productivity. Right. So there's this balancing act between getting to the point where things that are, that are entirely believable are, are treated as suspect. Um, so there's only so far you can go, because at that point you question everything and you put everything in your spam folder. So that basically means that that you definitely have to have resilience on the backside of that. Right. So mm -hmm. you, you need to think in least privilege. But if they break past that level, what's the next layer? in your environment that is ultimately going to protect that. And so that's a security architect kind of role. If you think about it, it's like, yep. how do I think about building resilience into the system? Um, 
How do I put checks and balances into the system? How do I force the user to potentially acknowledge something? And, and you will get more prompts. I mean, it's it's like in the MFA world, you will, you will end up getting more prompts in your yes. authenticator app and whatever else that says, is that right. really what you intended to do? Mm -hmm. Is this really what you intended to do? So stuff like that will definitely kind of occur. I think in the security operations side, um, where alerts are flowing in, right? Uh, I think this technology ultimately will help a lot with the alert fatigue. It will help in, at two levels. Okay. Mm -hmm. It will help both in terms of summarizing information and for you um, being able to potentially query different systems that have very different schemas and different query languages and even different units of measure. You know, like one system will say, this is the number of kilobytes transferred, and the other system will say this is the number of bytes transferred. And it's like, okay, now I've got to get these numbers to actually align and compare yes. and stuff like that. Sure. So LLMs are good in terms of you can explain things to them. You can sit them down like a child, explain things to them, and they will then understand those formats and convert between them and, and do all kinds of stuff for you. So a lot of the drudgery uh, can come out of it. I think the other element of it, which is really around SOC automation, it's like if you thought about SOARs in the past and like like just work basically automation of things where you want to memorialize a certain decision and and into the future execute on them. Uh, these these LLMs and generative AI is good. They're good at generating code and and basically automation is just a script. And where there has been a lot of friction, in fact, is trying to get the humans to write the script in precisely the right way. Well, what if you could just say to the LLM, hey, anytime a machine belonging to someone in business unit A transfers more than four gigabytes of data in a four hour span, I want you to activate a second MFA factor. So you just say this in English, right? And whatever the mm -hmm. backend language needs to be for that to actually happen, yep. you can imagine the LLM writing the code for it. Now, what you don't want to do is you don't want LLMs to run automatically automation in their current yeah. state because then right. that's called Skynet and that, you know, then you get a whole bunch of movies. Right. Um, so since you don't want Skynet, what you really want the LLM to do is to produce the script for you, show it to the to, to the analyst or security architect and say, here, well, here is my codification of what you just said. You look at it, you go, yep, right, 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 right. Okay, commit. And so subsequent to this, that automation will run not at the behest of the LLM, it'll run at the behest of the system. Mm -hmm. But the LLM was a co-author of that script along with the analyst or, or architect who basically partook in that process. Yeah, I'm sort of based on this, uh, again, this feels like kind of like a new paradigm for some pretty common security processes. Um, what would you say to people who are just getting started in terms of what they thought they would be doing in their security roles versus stuff like this? Like, how do you, you know, if, if you know that there's certain things you thought you were going to have to be doing, you know, quote unquote, by hand, and now is going to be sort of, uh, you know, automated for you yeah. to evaluate and and commit to and stuff like that. Like, how does that, how does that change the sort of like arc of what like, uh, you know, an entry level security position will look like? Yeah, I think, I think it, it will mean that, you know, your initial bootstrapping into the role and becoming effective will be more quick because yeah. you're not learning all these different dialects and all these different terms and stuff like that. Um, and and when you do have questions, you can just ask the LLM to explain it to you. Mm -hmm. So you have like this, this, this learn, you know, LMS, this learning, learning system that's basically just there that's got this information that you can kind of just interact with in natural language. It's like, yeah, I don't understand that. Explain it to me. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So I think I think it'll help people learn faster. It'll 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 lower the friction of them being able to interact with data sets and tools and other kinds of things like that. Um, I think it puts, quite frankly, just more of a, a premium on critical thinking. Right? Can yes, you right. form a mental model of what an attacker might be trying to do, um, and then form the right sets of questions? Yep. And that help expose whether it's, you know, blue pill or or, or red pill, right? It's like, did mm -hmm. it go left or right at this fork mm -hmm. based on what I know? So I think less of a less of a premium on just knowing a lot of detailed information about how to, you know, code up this SQL command or um, 
you, you're a Splunk query aficionado, or you know you know exactly what you know Zeek format for for network data metadata is. We live in a world where that has been a, a a huge problem anyway, because everything is changing so rapidly in each of these enclaves that keeping up to date information on what Azure logs look like and what yeah. CloudTrail stuff looks like and right. what happening on AD and what's happening with this attacker tool. So this is where LLMs can help level the playing field that all of that complexity can be reduced down. But then it's like, okay, you are at the top of the pyramid now, um, rather than being just a drone at the bottom, right? Doing, mm -hmm. doing these menial tasks, you are the orchestrator above that. And so learning how to deal with these systems and in many ways also, um, one of the strange things is like your language skills now actually become more important. It's like, hey, yeah, why would I want to be an English major? It's like, well, maybe you can you you actually learn how to use language to express thoughts clearly. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so so I think language and the expressiveness of language and the precision with which you exp express language becomes um, more of a premium. Although again, the nice thing about LLMs is that they 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 are iterative. Chatbots are iterative, right? You can ask a question, and if they, you didn't quite get it right, you can riff off of that. And very similar to kind of investigations. If you think about investigations, typically are you collecting this piece of data and this piece of data and this piece of data and refining it? Um, if you think of a chat window, it's very much that same kind of thought process, right? You have this piece of information, you asked a question about it, it returned that. As a result of that, you might have asked another question. As long as you're doing it in the same chat context, all that information kind of comes together. Mm -hmm. And the next question that you ask is against the sum of what you have accumulated to at that moment in time. It's not in isolation against the last answer that you got. And so this makes for very interesting just thought processes. I think people, the new generation that comes along in the age of these kinds of systems will, will just think very differently. And I think the the, the, the people who've been at this for 10 or 20 years, will um, they'll, ha they'll have to kind of almost like reboot their brains to adjust at times to yeah. they're thinking about it. Um, just to, uh, and I'm, uh, I hate the phrase devil's advocate or whatever, but like just to sort of uh, think through that, is there anything lost by not having that that sort of like deep multi-year knowledge of all of these specific sort of coding workarounds and things like that is is that really yeah yeah I mean, is, I think is, is there something lost in that and 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 is there any benefit to sort of like knowing that stuff you know in theory always, anyway even if you're not going to be using as much there always there's always something lost right I mean it's mm -hmm. like but 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 this is like uh, in general if you look at technology and and uh and, and the curve of technology, it, it just, it changes in these ways. You can always yes. lament things, right? Um, you know, it used to be, you could look at a car engine, right? And figure out what the hell was going on on right, it, right? right. And, and, and somebody who has deep knowledge in car engines, even as they became more mechanized, as, as you had to plug them into diagnostic systems in order to get kind of get things, still had an intrinsic, knowledge about how the car worked and yeah that sounds like it's an alternator or a carburetor or something like that yep, right yep but the cost of attaining that that mastery juxtaposed against the the ability to kind of get a you know a, a subset of that mastery by just plugging it into a diagnostic port so you can mm -hmm. lament the fact that the new kids don't know how an engine actually runs they're just like the new mechanics just plug it in and then replace the part and so I think we will always lament the fact that a certain craft and a certain art, I mean, I, you know, like, like a lot of people it, during the pandemic, I've gotten back into like, okay, I'm my own sourdough starter. I'm making my own bread, this artisanal thing, right? And it's like, yeah, you can lament the fact that that's lost, but it's like, compare that to the, okay, I have a life and I have to go buy a loaf of bread to feed my family. Do I really mm -hmm. want to spend, um, you know, 24 hours making a loaf of bread? Yeah, um, I'm. I, I guess I'm not really speaking as much about the loss of the artistry of it so much as you know one of the things we hear so much about uh, what separates a good entry level professional from a mediocre one is their being able to explain why they did what they did in a pro even if the problem isn't solved correctly. We want to be able to see your thought process, and if mm -hmm. we're taking away a lot of the actual sort of work process of it, are they still going to be able to say, "Well, this is what I did," and not just 
I flip this yeah. switch and then this happens. Yeah, right? it's, just, it's just a different altitude, right? These are the questions mm-hmm. I asked and why is different right. than these are the commands that I ran and why, right? Sure. I think okay. there's still a need for, I, th- I think the accumulated experiences that you have and the, and the savvy that comes with that to ask the right questions yes. at the right moments in time based on the scant information that's in front of you because you have these patterns that you've encountered before and you've seen this is you're not your first first rodeo. You've seen all these things play out before. You have certain kinds of um, uh, intuitions and, and, and go tos. Yep. I think that will continue to be the case. It's just that it happens at a different altitude. Gotcha. It doesn't happen at the you know I knew exactly like this PowerShell command to run. Got it. That okay. will begin to have just less utility to it because if you mm-hmm. can just say in English, hey, run me a PowerShell command to list me out all of the volumes that have foo. Mm-hmm. Like okay, yes, I could, I could, I could say that I know how to write that PowerShell command, but it's like, what is the nominal utility of that yeah. compared to using a system like that, like like this? And I think what people who are incredibly skilled at this craft need to think about is they're struggling to keep up with the incredible breadth and variety yes. of systems out there, right? Yeah. And so yeah. what this really represents for them is an opportunity to actually increase their capability and scope to be able to cover all kinds of disparate systems yep. that that you know if done manually from the ground up would just be an incredible amount of time and energy spent to become competent like can you really like even can you really understand the security par- the characteristics of azure gcp and aws mm-hmm. like, right. i struggle to find people who actually understand these three systems yeah. deeply yeah. right much right. less Azure AD and Microsoft 365 and Salesforce mm-hmm. and the network and AD and yes. everything else on-prem, right? So this is an opportunity to basically, in some senses, purge your mind of the minutia. Yeah, yeah. Right, and yeah. become slightly more a cerebral level, the, the, the sage person who can actually look at this stuff at a, at a right altitude to find yeah. new, new style threats. Yeah, no, and, and, and uh, you know, thinking back to you know three four years ago when I when we started this podcast, that was one of the things we would constantly hear is that you know fifty uh, percent of what you learn you know in your training is going to be obsolete in six months or whatever, and yeah. so that you're here you're sort of closing that gap in terms of uh, a lot of the stuff that you had to sort of know you need to know sort of yeah. brute force that you don't need to know anymore necessarily. Yeah, yeah, it's it's, it's both the obsolescence and the, also the mushrooming and, and the size. Yes. Right? It's like again, mm-hmm. if you go back ten. 20 years, right, it might have been slower to get obsolete, but also this corpus of information that you needed to know was quite a bit more constrained. You need mm-hmm. to know Windows laptops, you need to know, you know, yep. NT servers, you needed to know Active Directory, and you need to know network. Yep. And now, if you know all of those things, you know 25% of what you need to know, right, in the, in the yep. modern world that you live in. So it's the the, the balkanization of the universe and the systems that that universe inhabits the mm-hmm. penchant by organizations to adopt more and more things to be agile, fast, productive, each of which is a snowflake from a security perspective and has its own problems ultimately uh, from a security perspective. And so for the modern security professionals, I think LLMs can't come fast enough in, in trying to abstract out some of that bottom layer complexity. Yeah, you can you still have the skills where if you need to, you can go dig into it. Yep. But that that parlor trick of knowing exactly how to code up the the, the PowerShell command yeah. that does a particular thing, it's going to become less useful. Yeah. Uh, so the, speaking in terms of, uh, again, the sort of job framework of things, do you think there are certain uh, sort of job roles within cybersecurity that might become more niche in the future because of these practices, the way that like being an expert at tape backups is less ubiquitous now in the age of the cloud. Is there are there things that people might be pursuing now that you would say, uh, yeah, that's probably not going to be very useful down the line. Maybe uh, maybe go for something that might be yeah, think, more up and coming. I, I think you know one of the interesting questions to ask yourself is like you know getting hyper specialized in a thing mm-hmm. when when that thing is likely to become commoditized in terms of just the base knowledge of it. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it, it speaks to a time where you want to be more of a generalist than a, than a, than a, than a specialist, right? So if you're like, okay. well, I'm going to be really, I'm going to be the, the guy who figures out how to secure an Oracle database, you know, it's like, okay, that's, that's going to be a fleeting, um, 
you know, if you look over the next five years, I fully expect an AI system to be able to like look at your config for that system and to shoot holes through it and tell you what you should be doing in order to basically secure it. And and maybe somebody who's really, really, really expert can outperform the LLM at that point in five years, but it's at the margins. I mean, it reminds me of the, you know, one, one of the reasons uh, Starbucks ultimately went with like fully automatic espresso systems. It's not that, you know, a really good barista could not outperform the quality of coffee uh, of an espresso shot that's pulled by those machines. It's just that nine, it, it outperformed 90% of their employees, right? And mm-hmm. so do you do you make things better 90% of the time, right? Right. It's effectively standardized to that level, or do you leave room for the for the for the 10% and they clearly kind of make the decision to go with the former rather than the latter? And yeah, as the, as the line goes out the door. Yeah, yeah. right, right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um uh, as we um, start to wrap up today, uh, I wanted to maybe uh, talk a little more philosophically. I mean, again, like I think, th- did you guys have a sense that that th- this feels like the year of AI? Everyone's talking about AI this way, that way. I mean, it's obviously been happening for years now, but did you see any particular signs that this was going to be the year that we all like got on board with it? And oh, if so... Right. I- no, yeah. anybody tells you they saw the AI, generative AI revolution coming uh, is probably blowing smoke. Um, yeah, I think it became evident certainly as you start playing with GPT three point five. It became evident like, huh, this is because, because one of the strange things that happened is that there was this theory that said if you make a large language model large enough, it might impress you. I'm just using technical jargon now, right? And sure. or then maybe the law of diminishing returns, right? So what is it going to be? Is it like if you if you scale it, does it start to plateau in capability? Or if you scale it beyond a certain point, does it suddenly go exponential? Mm-hmm. Well, it turned out it went exponential, right? And, but but how many people knew that? Um, not that many people. The people that pursued that, pursued that as a bet, not as a known thing. Um, but it became pretty evident. And, and, and now I think we're, we live in a world where that core tech will move at, a, at its own sort of, sort of pace. But the big thing is the smart application of that capability to a broad set of problems. And as I said, this is really a user experience, a user interface, yep. mental modeling kind of problem across a broad set of spaces. That's going to keep us busy for years to come. Yeah. While the core tech continues to improve, uh, I don't expect over the next year or two, the core tech will change as dramatically as it has over the last year. Right. Uh, I think you're now to kind of a place where there will be marginal improvements. You're seeing- Yeah, there was the big jump Obama, and then it's going to be like Barrick this for a while. And yeah. OpenAI and others, right? You're yep. seeing yep. kind of roughly, okay, this is kind of the state of the state right now. So a lot of the heavy lifting now is really going to be around smart application of it. Um and that'll take that'll take years. I mean, in, mm-hmm. in some places it'll it'll take a decade or more. Um, For sure. But I think we'll get better at that. We'll get better at the craft of how to design those user experiences in a way that gives you maximum benefit while not leading you too far astray. Um, but again, the systems are will not be perfect. And I think that the the, the 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 mistakes people make is to harp on their imperfections rather than yeah. to think about the ways in which they can actually make your life easier. Yeah. Okay. Well, to that end, uh, you know, we, we touched on it just for a, a second there, like you said, the, the, some people are are in this extremity of like AI will destroy humanity and others are saying AI will become the new utopia and stuff like that. Do you, is there any recommendation you have in terms of the way we talk about this stuff? Because I, you know, it does seem like people's sort of, uh, knee-jerk mental response is either camp A or camp B, and and I still think that it might be upon you know our industry maybe to uh, sort of change the way that people think of it as as either being yeah, you know, I, a savior think, or the angel of darkness. You know, for those of us who have spent enough time reading about this these topics and digging into them, I think it's just incumbent upon us to have th- these kinds of conversations to to demystify what what these things are what they're good yeah. at what they're bad at like i'm 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 traveling to europe this weekend i have a couple of customer uh, events one on tuesday in zurich one on thursday in hamburg germany mm-hmm. and basically what i'm what, what i'm what i'm presenting on is llms threats and opportunities right and mm-hmm. this is connected really from from our product but just talking about it in terms of like what are they what can they do what are they good at what are they bad at 
How will attackers use them? How will defenders use them? Yep. Begin to kind of create a a set of information for people to actually intelligently be able to think about it. It's like there is no one answer to this problem. And so it's not the unfortunate thing is there's not a single sentence that I come up with that is like if you internalize this sentence, you will for you know forever answer. Right, right, right. You know, understand this stuff. It's not a haiku poem. It it is it is more like a 45 minute presentation, but I think we will get better at talking to each other about it. As okay. more experiences begin to come out, I think people will have firsthand experiences beyond beyond the cuteness of just going to chat GPT and typing in, you know, uh, some obscure question to something and seeing if it impresses you or not. Yeah. Getting actual mileage under your belt in, in terms of trying to do work and trying to do things of value. That's a great advice. Yeah. Also mm-hmm. give people a better sense of, you know, the 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 the, the, the what the box produces, right? Yeah, not just the extremities of what it can do, but what it's actually probably going to do for most people. Uh, So as we wrap up today, um, tell our listeners about Vectra AI and and some of the uh, sort of product services and sort of big things you've got coming up uh, in the future that you're excited to tell people about. Uh, As as I noted at the beginning, I think for us, we've been pursuing the strategy, which lately has kind of uh, gotten the moniker of XDR. So how can we take the attack surfaces that have become more and more complicated for customers, mm-hmm. be it AWS, be it GCP, be it Azure, be it Microsoft 365, be it your federated identity in the cloud, be it your on-prem network, your end users. How do, how do we take those surfaces, instrument as much attack signal as we can out of them, stitch those together in a way that you can kind of see the full arc up of an attack and, and so for us, this is really the, the journey that we're on with our customers. They have made their work world a lot more complex as they've kind of um, kicked everything out of their data center and uh, you know used a whole bunch of different applications and cloud systems. And now we're trying to kind of get that, help them get that back under control. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we continue to grow at a rapid clip. We're obviously in a climate where we have to grow carefully. Like we're all now in climates like like three years ago, where we're in a climate where print money, you know, money was cheap. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, as we as we coalesce towards you know our goals and and uh, we we are we are being really smart about um, the battles we pick and and uh, the, the the markets that we pursue. But basically, we are we are the guys who want to basically be in the corner of the of the stock analyst and help them deal with these tr- threats as they occur. Yep. Um, it is our mission, and has always been our mission, to um, really come come in at the point that the threat has manifested itself somewhat in your environment. There's some hooks into the environment, okay. but before it does, you undo harm, and to use that time judiciously. Yes. Uh, and for us, that means exposing as much signal and telling as clear and concise a story. And again, this is where generative AI will help tell a more compelling story and, yeah. and form a more compelling narrative um, that that the that the analyst can understand. And so that is the business that we're in. Um, the world is plenty complicated. We're trying to make it less complicated. We're trying to take the brunt of that complexity and ultimately yes. make it less complicated for our customers who have adopted a lot of complexity but but uh, are struggling to deal with that those decisions oh gosh yes well that's 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 great thank you for the uh, for the update on that one last question here if our listeners want to know more about Albert Havacoli and Vecta Vecta Vectra AI uh, where should they go online where, where can we find uh, you? so so online uh, we're just www.vectra.ai so easy okay. you know our name just add some dots yep um, and for me uh, uh, you can just Google me. I have I have a weird enough combination of first and last name that I'm one of a kind. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So Oliver Tavacoli. Um, you'll see um, any kind of blogs that I've written, uh, papers that I've written, and uh, as well as podcasts that I've done. Uh, yeah, you 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 have a, a pretty good LinkedIn presence as well, as far as I can tell. A lot yeah. of your a lot of your writing is over there, so people should definitely check that out. Uh, well, Oliver, thank you so much for your return to the show. It was really great catching up with you. It was good talking to you, Chris. Uh, and as always, I'd like to thank you all who uh, have been listening to and watching the Cyborg Podcast on a massive scale this year. We're really glad to have all our new listeners along for the ride. So before you go, I just want to invite you all to visit infosecinstitute.com slash free to get a whole bunch of free stuff for Cyborg listeners, including our new security awareness training series, Workbytes, 
which features a host of fantastical employees, including a zombie, a vampire, a princess, and a pirate making security mistakes and hopefully learning from them. Also visit infosecinstitute.com slash free for your free cybersecurity talent development ebook. It's got in-depth training plans for the 12 most common roles, including SOC analyst, penetration tester, cloud security engineer, information risk analyst, privacy manager, secure coder, and more. And there is more even on the site. Uh, we keep adding new stuff to it, but for cyber listeners, just go to infosecinstitute.com slash free. And yes, the link will be in the description below. Uh, thanks once again to Oliver Tavacoli and to Vectra AI. And thank you all so much for watching and listening. And as always, we will talk to you next week. Take care now.